to join me in prayer. We thank you, God, for, as we heard this morning, being with us as we go on this journey called life. May your presence sustain us in the midst of at times difficult times and decisions so that together we can discover the freedom that you're calling us to embrace, even if it's calling us to the unknown. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So one of my, um, not one of my favorite uh, uh, rock band is called uh, the Foo Fighters. I don't know how many of you are familiar with them, but um, they um, they have a song um, called "The Pretender," and uh, this song came out in 2007. And um, according to Dave Grohl, who is the singer and the one who composed this song, and he, by the way, is from um, from Virginia. Um, he said that when he wrote this song, he was inspired by, um, you know, all the political unrest in the world, all the tragedies that were happening, and he thought that this song would represent a little bit of the lack of sometimes involvement of people in all these issues and just keep going with life as if anything had happened. And so, for example, lyrics such as, uh, I am finished, making sense, done, done, pleading ignorance, you know, talks a little bit about that fact that he's done with pretending that the world is fine and basically, regardless of how you may interpret the song or what you may hear in the song, he's just asking a very simple question. Are we going to pretend that everything is fine and are we going to be pretenders or are we going to get involved? Are we going to become pretenders, or are we going to really become real people who care about other people? So I want you to think about that for a moment because we will come back to that. But as we are beginning today our second week of sermons on the B-sides of Moses, which again, if you are wondering why do we have a cassette tape on the bulletin, it's because we're talking about these uh, stories that uh, although they're part of the, the amazing stories of the people of Israel in Exodus, sometimes these are the stories that we skip out because they're either too long or they don't make any sense. And so today, uh, we're looking at this uh, stor story that kind of tells a story about a very important moment in the peop uh, for the people of Israel. So let me give you some background. Um, after many trials and tribulations, which actually seems to be the theme of the people in Exodus, after many trials and tribulations suffered by the people of Israel in the, midst, in the middle of the desert, uh, they continue to wrestle with a lot of questions about who they are, doubts, uh, questions about who God is, and most importantly, you know, what's going to happen to us now that we are out of Egypt, a place that was not the best place, but at least it was a place that we knew. And so in this quest, not just to find the promised land, the people of Israel are really having a hard time understanding not only who they are, but who God is. And uh, they're beginning to wonder at times, you know, is God playing capricious cosmic games with us? You know, by taking us out into the desert and doing all these crazy things, are we just, what are we to you, God? And so, as a moment of a very important uh, affirmation from God to the people of Israel, God decides that in order to give them a sense of peace in their relationship with God and in the purpose that God has for all of them, God decides that God wants to prove to them that God is not playing games, that God is real and serious about bringing the people of Israel into a land of freedom. But most importantly, God has chosen the people of Israel to be a people that will share the message of who God truly is. And so to prove God's seriousness and that God is not a pretender who doesn't care and is just playing games with them, to seal the deal, so to speak, in that relationship with them, God then gives to Moses detailed instructions to build what we call the Ark of the Covenant. Now, 
the Ark of the Covenant is this um, thing that is a wooden chest clad with gold containing, as you can see it over there from the Indiana Jones movie, uh, which was the best picture, by the way. Um, this, this artifact contains the two stone tablets of the Ten Commandments, Aaron's rod that at some point it, was, uh, it produced flowers. Um, you have manna, which is the bread from heaven, some bread from heaven. And basically, this artifact that will represent God's presence among the people of God before they build the temple. And it is also uh, uh, an altar that contains symbols of those moments when God made promises to the people of Israel, covenants with them. You know, this idea that God made a promise to them that God was going to be their God and God was not going to abandon them. Now, this, this Art of the Covenant, again, uh, as all the picture is already telling you, you might be familiar with it because it was the, the, the theme of the first Indiana Jones movie. Uh, and the truth of the matter is that there was something that the movie got right. The Ark of the Covenant has been lost since the year 587 BC, since the Babylonians came and destroyed the temple. So there are still people really trying to find the Ark of the Covenant of the covenant, not just because it's an amazing artifact, but because just imagine finding the tablets of the Ten Commandments and all those things. So this might be the point where you're asking, why should I care about the Ark of the Covenant today? Well, I'm glad you're asking that question. Because you see, as much as the Ark of the Covenant was an object created and designed by God to be respected and to function as a clear reminder of God's love and faithfulness. The Ark of the Covenant was simply a means to an end. It was not the end itself. Let me just go back a little bit. Throughout this entire journey of the people of Israel through the desert into freedom, what has undoubtedly sustained Moses as the leader of Israel, more than the miraculous parting of the sea, more than the miraculous manna from heaven, more than the miraculous physical tablets of the Ten Commandments, more than this miraculous rod, more than anything, what has sustained Moses has been his personal relationship with God. A relationship with God that kept guiding and teaching Moses new ways to love God, new ways of being, new ways of relating to God and to each other. And Moses, throughout this journey, was slowly beginning to understand that this relationship with God was founded in a love that was bigger than anything he had known, even bigger than the Ark of the Covenant and its holy contents. Little by little, Moses was discovering that God could not be contained in an Ark of the Covenant, or for that matter, in any holy objects or temples. For God is way bigger than any building, any object, any Ark of the Covenant. Because here's also what Moses began to discover. What happens when a holy object, a holy building, make their way to the center of our faith and devotion? What happens? Well, we get in trouble. We get in trouble because we are simply human. Now, here's a confession of mine to all of you. It would have been an amazing experience for me to be one of the people who actually got to see the Ark of the Covenant. Let me just say that. I can imagine seeing this artifact, but most importantly, I could not imagine being able to see the tablets of the Ten Commandments, manna, and this rod. I mean, I just think about it for a moment, and here in front of me are these things that came directly from the hand of God. And I would have a, have a very hard time not being distracted by them. 
I would have a really hard time not devoting my entire attention to those objects and to care for those objects and to really, forgive me for saying this, but to making maybe a small idol out of that. Because you can, can you imagine being able to see those things that God created from God's own hand? And yet, what Moses was beginning to learn, even probably against his own human nature, was that the Ark of the Covenant and all these things were not the pinnacle of God's awesomeness. It was just an instrument to guide us to the real thing, which is a personal relationship with God so that together we could become God's community in the world. Sadly, though, the story will tell us that the people of Israel felt that the Ark of the Covenant was more important than anything else, and that this instrument that God created little by little became their God with a lower GK, a lower case G. They traded the real thing for a thing, and in the process, they hurt themselves and others. They began to worship the Ark of the Covenant and its powers, and they forgot entirely about God. And if we are all honest, we can very easily do the same. Because here's what happened to them. When you have the real Ten Commandments, why bother to live by the Ten Commandments? When you have the manna from heaven, why bother that you can trust that God will care for all of your needs? When you have a miraculous rod, why pray to God for deliverance and guidance? And little by little, they began to trade their relationship with God for worshiping the things that led them to have a relationship with God. And in the process, they lost themselves and they lost their relationship with God. Because you see, before, you may remember this better because this is one of Moses' more and better known stories. Before there was a golden calf that was worshiped, there was an Ark of the Covenant that got him on the path to journey false idols. There is this, uh, I remember hearing this when I was in third grade back in Mexico, and I've been really doing some research to see if it was true, and I really don't know if this is an urban legend or is not true, but this is what my teachers told, told me. When the Spaniards came to Mexico and they conquer Mexico and America, um, Moctezuma, the Aztec emperor, after they had a little battle and blah, 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 they actually make their way to see the emperor, the Aztec emperor. And the Spaniards were as astounded for all the gold that they saw around. And in their exchange as a peace offering for each other, the Spaniards exchanged trinkets and mirrors for gold because the Aztecs had never seen a mirror. I don't know who you think won in that exchange, but the Aztecs exchanged gold for mirrors because they didn't know that they already had the real thing and they settled. A pastor friend of mine was sharing with me how um, in his church, the kitchen has become a battleground, a beautiful kitchen that they just had renewed, remodeled. It was not a really nice kitchen and then somebody donated money and it became an industrial kitchen. And uh, the battle is because some people in the church don't want anybody to mess with the kitchen. They don't want it to get dirty. 
because it is so precious and so beautiful, and it costs so much money that you have to levitate when you go into the kitchen. <laughs> you need to get on a list a year before if you want to use it. People have left the church, those in favor of using the kitchen and those in favor of not letting people use the kitchen. Because, you know, the kitchen has become an idol. And so forget about the people who are hungry, forget about the food that could be given, forget about the opportunities to serve people. The kitchen has become the idol. I have another friend, this, is, this friend is not a pastor, but this friend tells me that his grandmother has this beautiful china. And um, it's so beautiful, no one has used it in 70 years. Because they're waiting for this amazing special location that it never comes. Because this china was a gift from a family, from generation to generation to generation, to the point that it has not been used in 70 years. And I don't know about you, but I think that plates are supposed to be used for food, right? So where is Moses leading us this week? Well, is there an object, an institution, that we worship more than God? Are there some family rules that have become more important than reconciliation in our families? Have we forgotten to keep the main thing, the main thing? So let us this morning, with humility, rec recognize that maybe at times we have confused the building, we have confused the rules, we have confused a worship style, we have confused a schedule, a calendar for God. Because to be quite honest, they are just means to an end. And the end is always to love God and love others wholeheartedly with all our mind, with all our soul and strength. The end is always to not forget that we've been chosen to be God's people, God's community in the world with a story to tell that is way bigger than any of us. Amen.